We've come. We've come to give God the glory. To give God the glory. Oh yes, we've come. Oh yes, we've come to give Him praise. To give Him praise. We come. We come to give Him the honor. To give Him the honor. Let's magnify Him. Let's magnify Him. All of our ways. In all of our ways. Who are we? We're interceding, Christian Center. We hope that you felt welcome. From the time that you entered. God bless you, beloved. Once again, Dr. Schaefer, the pastor of Interceding Christian Center, located at 414 Thompson Avenue in the city of West Memphis. My friends, before we get into this sermon, I want you to do something for me. Go on this side and like us. Go on this side and subscribe to us. Therefore, you'll be updated with all the latest content, sermons, and such from Interceding Christian Center, a place where we aspire to bring God's people into spiritual knowledge and thus victory. On the other day, the Lord dropped into my spirit something coming from the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, it says this, it says that God will not be mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, he shall also reap it. My friends, let's go into the sanctuary here with thus said the Lord from this sermon that's entitled, The Harvest Principle. And in it we find these words. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Consider thyself, lest thy also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate to him that teacheth in all the things. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your hope. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your peace and understanding. We're praying right now, Father God, that you would bless this time of worship, Lord God. Lord God, that you would open my mouth, open my mind, understand so I may minister a word to some soul, Lord God, that is in need of hope, Lord God. Lord God, be it in this setting that we're in right now, or be it that someone sees it later, Lord God, and knows that there is hope in the powerful name of Jesus. No, Lord God, that their struggle is not in vain. No, Lord God, that they shall be okay. Hallelujah. They shall be okay. It's by your name and by your blood that we declare these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. To God be the glory. I tell you, I'm thanking God for all things. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to minister to you from a topic the Lord dropped into my spirit that's entitled The Harvest Principle. The hardest principle. Now, I know this will come straight from the Lord because, guess what? My notes <laughs> just got corrupted. So I know this will come straight from the Lord. It won't be coming from Brian's spirit too much. Amen. It's coming straight from the Lord. The harvest principle. What is the harvest principle? Well, in the Bible, it expresses to us in several places, whereas if a man plants a seed in the ground, then he can be assured that that seed will produce something. That seed will produce something. And we're not to be surprised when that seed does produce after its own kind. Because even in Genesis, it tells you that the seed that is planted in the ground, and God commands the seed to produce after its own kind. After its own kind. Now, what we need to understand is that nothing is produced that is not within the seed already. Nothing that's produced that's not within the seed already. That is that what the orange seed produces are trees. And those trees produce fruit. But the fruit therein is not a distant relative of the seed that it ultimately came from. 
The seed, the seed is a relative, a close relative of the tree that it ultimately produces. Another of the truths of the law is that you should not be quickly fooled just because the orange seed and the orange tree don't look the same. All you have to do is look inside of that fruit and you'll once again find the kinship of that fruit to the seed that it produced. So, that tiny seed that's caught within, which doesn't seem to contain a tree, contains multiple trees, contains many trees. That, can tree, that seed contains many trees and many fruits. This is the natural law of reciprocity. And, and this law also states that potential is limited by your actions or your lack thereof. Potential has as its root one rule, and that rule is to get what you want. In order to get what you want, you have to give up something that you have. See, a seed has to die in order for it to produce a tree. A seed has to die in order for that tree to come forth. In order for that tree to come forth, then fruit to come forth from that tree. That seed must first die. It's potential. That's what it is. It's potential. Potential as as its root that as its root that one root that you have to give up something that you have to get something that you want. If the seed remains inside of the orange, then there would be no trees. So when the potential is unleashed and that same potential is buried, the burial process is not as unto death, but the burial process is as unto life. So when the potential is unleashed in the burial process, and I thank you, Jesus, because your potential, Lord God, was released for us, for us unto life when you were buried in the grave. But when you rose up with all power and authority, your potential showed, Lord God, that we can rise up again one day. I just heard someone say if they knew that I was a seed, they wouldn't have buried me in the first place. And I hear you, Lord. I hear you because sometimes people will bury you because they don't realize that you are a seed. Sometimes they will turn their back on you because they didn't realize that God had a purpose and you're being buried. Oh, my God. See, your potential may look like it has hit a wall. Your potential may look like it ain't going to go no further. But through the law of reciprocity, that seed first dies. And when it dies, it cracks open. And when it cracks open, the trees that eventually come are going to eventually come. The Bible tells us that God says, he promises that seeds will always have potential. God promises this to us. To us. In the oracles of God that are found after the flood in Genesis 8, God promised as long as the earth remains, there will be summer. As long as the earth remains, there will be winter. As long as the earth remains, there will be fall, there will be spring. And as long as man plants seeds, there will be a harvest. This is the harvest principle. He said, by the earth remains, there will be seeds. There will be, there will be, you may not be able to tell one season for another, but those seasons will be there. And he said, in due time, there will be harvest. I'm talking about seed, time, and harvest. This ought to encourage you to keep planting seed, because seed over time will become harvest. Now, who goes to an orange orchard in search of seeds, but expect to find only a few seeds, not many people? A single orange may have up to 50 seeds or more. And that orange may be on a tree with hundreds of oranges in a grove with thousands of trees. But every orange, every orange seed, every tree, and every grove can trace its roots back to one seed that was planted. What we often miss as Christians is this principle. We miss this principle. You're going to get what you put in. What you put in the ground is what you're going to get. And what you put in the ground, you're going to get in abundance. So only a fool would plant apple seeds expecting orange trees. Only a fool would be mistreating, let me get back down to home. Only a fool would be mistreating others and not expect for their time of mistreatment to come. Verse 7 says that God is not going to be mocked. God is not going, I'm not going to be, don't be deceived, don't get caught up in yourself and think that God is going to be mocked. If you do it, it's going to come back to you in one way or another. And the thing is that the seed may not look like the results of what you end up harvesting, but it's a result of the seed being planted. In other words, what your seeds look like, it will produce after its own kind. 
So if you need a blessing in a certain area of your life, and we all need blessings, in a certain area of your life you need blessings. And from time to time, we need blessings. And sometimes the things that come up against us look like mountains. We need spiritual blessings. We need, we need our bodies healed. We, we need family problems to be worked out. We need fear to be put under check. We need our financial issues to be put underneath our thumb. We need these things. But the scripture in the Bible tells us that if we want something, then we've got to learn to give up something. If we want our seed to produce after its own kind, then we've got to learn to to, to submit our seed unto the ground. See, every, every act of faith is a seed planted. And those seeds will be multiplied back to you many times according to the word of God. The next important thing is to aim your seed. Aim your seed against the need. How do we aim our seed against the need? We have to identify the need. And, and it's easy to identify needs, but it's hard, it seems, to identify the seed. And it's even hard to get the seed out of the hand of those with the need. You, see, see, identify the purpose of that seed sowing. Why am I sowing seed? Oh, why am I working against this hard ground? Why am I going? It's because God said seed, time, then harvest. So you identify the purpose of the seed sowing. Then you ask God about the thing that you believe. Lord, is this something within your will? God is not going to give you something that's outside of his will. If it's something that's going to, to, going to only edify you, then God is not going to give it to you. If it's something that's going to bring him glory, then he'll give it. If it's something that's going to hurt someone else, God is not going to do it. Is it according to his word? Then the next thing that we talk about this in the faith principle is we have to say it out loud. Speaking our word of faith is so important. We have to say it out loud. Say it out loud. See, we have dominion over the earth because we have dominion over the earth. We are to speak forth out of our mouth what it is that we want things to be, how things should be. We have to speak forth out of our mouth. So say it loud. <laughs> out of our mouth. Say it loud. Say it loud. And then we aim our faith. We aim our faith. We apply the word of God there. There are promises in the word of God. We got to know what those promises are in the word of God. We got to apply the word of God to our lives by stating those promises. Believing that God is going to do it. Believing he's going to change things around. That he's going to make a way out of nowhere. We have to speak forth out of our mouth that God is going to work things out for our good. We got to speak forth in our mouth with a Romans 8 and 28 mentality that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Yeah. And then there's the other thing is that we have to look to God as our source not to man. Many times we fail because we look to man for our source. We think that man is going to provide for us. We, we, we don't realize that man only gave you things that they gave because God had him to give it to you. God had, and the same thing that man gave you before, those things are plentiful in the kingdom of heaven. And God is going to make sure. Oh, I heard what David, he said, never I've seen a righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. Hallelujah. So, so, so God is going to make sure that people give unto your bosom because the Bible tells, give and it shall be given back to you. How? Press down. How? Shaking together. How? Run it over. Shall God give unto your bosom? Shall God command men to give unto your bosom? God command the righteous. He'll command the unrighteous. He'll command people to give to you because you are his child. So we're talking about seed, the harvest principle. Seed over time produces harvest. Seed over time produces harvest. Seed over time produces harvest. How many, how many watch pots, people watch pots? You watch the pot to see if the pot will boil. When you're watching the pot, it's not going to speed up the process of heating. The water it has to reach uh, 200 degrees or something like that in order for it to heat. You're not going to speed it up. You're, you don't have a laser vision where you can look at the pot and cause the pot to get hotter. You, it's not going to speed it up. A watch pot never boils. See, seed is first planted. And then the law between the planting and the harvest is not a time for you to sit around and do 
nothing. It's not a time for you to sit around and worry about if the seed is going to grow, if the seed is going to flourish. It's not a time. A pastor once used the analogy of a farmer does not buy a field that's already to be harvested. The clock of the harvest begins when the seed is planted, but while waiting on the seed to come up, there's some work that you have to do. You have to do certain work by waiting on it. See, see, your work ensures that the harvest is healthy. Your work ensures that the harvest is abundant. Your work, you have to cultivate it. You have to work over it. You have to water it. You have to dig around it. I used to see these people when I was living in Blytheville, and that's like, and it'd be Right after this cotton seed had been planted in the ground for about a month or so, and I would see these people that would pull up and they wouldn't have harvesting instruments in their hands. And I didn't know it at the time what they were doing because I was like, I don't know what they're doing out there trying to harvest cotton. It's not there yet. Didn't realize what they were doing, but there's something that they do. It's called chopping cotton. It's called chopping cotton. It's not picking cotton. That's something that's totally different. Chopping cotton is when they go out there and they weed around the cotton to make sure that the weed does not bury out. They dig around and they destroy the weeds that would ultimately destroy the cotton. Then after you dig around it, you give it all your attention to make it produce. The harvest that you are expecting, the harvest that you speak of, the harvest that you state is going to happen, the harvest that you believe is going to happen, the harvest that you trust in God is going to happen. There's some things you can do while doing your growing time. Sow seed for your harvest. That's the first thing we talked about that. If you desire a harvest in your life, one thing for sure is you can't reap it if you don't sow. If you don't sow, you cannot reap. You cannot sit around and just wait for the harvest to come without having sown some seeds somewhere. And the thing about seeds is that you have to sow some good seed. huh? You have to take something from a previous harvest sometime and you plant the good seed that was in that proven harvest. The enemy has tricked so many people, so many Christians that believe they can't afford to sow seed financially or any other way. He'll work overtime trying to keep you in fear about giving away your resources. Why? Because he knows the process. He knows that seed, time, and harvest. He knows that God is faithful. He wants to keep you away from what God has for you. He knows the effect of seeding in the natural as well as the spiritual realm. So therefore, he tries to keep you away from the blessings that God has for you. Oh, the Bible tells us in Luke 6 and 38, give and shelter be given back to you. How? Press down, how shake it, and run it over. I don't know about you, but I'm thanking God for an overflow of harvest. I thank God for an abundance. I thank God that my crops are how healthy in the field. I thank God that my barns are filled. I thank God that my vats are filled. I thank God that I'm not suffering from lack. What is seed? Seed is anything you give. You give it with your heart. It can be your time. Sometimes all we need, church all needs some time for people. Don't really need some money. Sometimes you just need time. Sometimes you just need a door open, resources. Sometimes you need people to pray for you, to pray for the church. Sometimes you, you need, you just need someone to say, I love you and just hug you and, and help you get through. Sometimes you need the most important part of sowing is the heart behind the gift. If I gave you something and I gave it to you in such a way that's discouraging, that's disparaging, in such a way that is demeaning unto you, then it does not feel as good. If I gave you one dollar and I was very sincere about giving you one dollar because it's the best dollar, the only dollar I had, it does not feel real good. If I gave you a million dollars and I treated you like crap. Oh, here's a million dollars. But I hate you. I hate everything about you. You're gonna, you ain't nothing. You're just such and such. You may not want to do that. Like, uh-uh. If someone tells you that, they're planning something in your life and they don't have the heart to plan your life. You feel it. You feel the difference. So when you're sowing, be a good sower. Second Corinthians 9, 6 says this. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. He who sows generously 
and with joy will reap generously and with joy. If you put a little bit in and you're mad about putting in, a farmer takes a seed, he throws it in the ground. Instead of nourishing that seed, putting that seed in the ground nicely and turning the dirt over that seed, he throws it on the ground, he stumps it into the ground, and then wonder why he's not getting a good harvest. When you give in sorrow, there is no faith behind it. So there is no return. So sow your seed in joy, and you will reap a harvest in joy, in joy, in joy. The second thing is that you have to get aggressive about your reaping your harvest. I want it all back. I want it all. I remember we did a thing. With, I want it all back. I want everything that the enemy has tried to take from me and everything he's took from generations of me. I want these things back. Hallelujah. And the thing is to be aggressive about it. Is, it says in the Bible that in certain days that, that in the day of John the Baptist until the present time, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. By the kingdom of heaven, I'm talking about second heaven. It suffers violence. It suffers violence. Why? It suffers violence because we're in the first realm of heaven, in the place that you can see, and we're trying to punch through the second realm of heaven to bring down the blessing that God Almighty has for us. And because of that, the angels are being released from third heaven, and they're having to fight while going to second heaven to bring down the blessing. So the kingdom of heaven does suffer violence in the second heaven. And we're supposed to be aggressive about what we want, what we need. We're supposed to be aggressive about what has been promised to us. We're supposed to be aggressive. A common misconception of the church is that we have to wait after planting the seed. Misconception about the principle of sowing and reaping is that we sow the seed and wait for God to do all of the work for us. We sow the seed and wait for God to reap for us. When we do this, we miss the very important part that we are to play. We sow the seed, God gives the increase, and then we gather in the harvest. In other words, we sow the seed that's in the ground in our faith. We work on that seed in order for that seed to produce a harvest. God gives increase because we're being faithful, and then we go out with our sickles and we reap the harvest. In other words, you must become a sower and a mower. Many people leave their harvest in the field expecting God to go into the field to get their harvest. If you leave your harvest in the field, your harvest will rot. Leave nothing on the table for the enemy to steal. It belongs to you. Every seed you ever planted is available to you if you haven't reaped it yet. Some of, the, some of the harvest may have died while waiting on you to come get it. But you can go and get your harvest. You can go and get your harvest. You've got to learn to speak this phrase aloud. I, I, I am not just a giver. I am a good reaper. I'm not just a good giver, but I am a good reaper. In other words, I'm not just one who plants seed, but I'm one who spends the time tending to my seed. I'm one who goes out to the field and I clean up the field. I get everything out of the field that is mine. It is mine. Third thing that we have a problem with is that we give up on our seed too quick. We give up real quick on our seed. In this very same set of scriptures, the very next verse, it says this, And be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not. Waiting is the hardest part about anything you do. It's the hardest part about anything you do. After you've completed your test and stuff like that for your for your uh, diploma, degree, or whatever, certification, or whatever. The waiting is that hard part. You're like, uh, even if you've been told, yeah, you passed with flying colors, but yet you're still waiting on that diploma. You're still waiting on that certificate. Waiting is the hardest thing that you do. But I've noticed that someone who goes through a course of instruction, uh, and I know that they're having a hard time waiting, I notice one thing is that they don't give up waiting on their diploma. They're expecting it. 
It better come quick. If it don't quick, they're going to call somebody at the state board. Where is my certificate? Where is my diploma? They're going to call the bursar at the school. They're going to call other people at the school. To determine where is my this, where is my that. I worked hard for it. So on the same token, you plant your seeds, you can call out while working to get your seed to grow faster, to get your seed to manifest, to get your seed to a point where you can harvest. See, if we sow seed in faith, we got to expect it. And you will get what you expect, no matter how long it takes. While you are working on your harvest, let your words and your faith agree with each other. Let your words and your faith agree. You may have a whole bunch of faith, but, but if you're not speaking out of your mouth what you already believe. Lord, I already got it. You got to have your words and your faith to agree with you. You cannot be saying something contrary to what you believe unless, of course, you don't really believe. And God remembers every seed you sow. He remembers, he knows where all the fields are, where you can harvest the seed at, you can harvest the, the crop at. He remembers these, and God will sometimes show you where those fields are. He'll show you somebody that you spent time with loving on, caring about. He'll show you somebody who cares about you. He'll show you some place to get your harvest. And you just remember that it may not come when you want to, but it will be on time. You got to remember that your harvest is coming. Fourth thing in there. Keep the weeds out of the harvest. Keep the weeds out of the harvest. There's a parable in the Bible that speaks of weeds and harvest. And it says that God says that when the man went out to the field, they said, hey, the enemy has planted terror in the, and he's planted terror in with the wheat. The farmer told him, oh, don't worry about it. Because in due time, in due time, when the wheat grows up and the wheat's mature enough to take it, then we'll take the wheat out and we'll remove and burn the tear. We'll remove and burn the tear. Wow. Now see, the thing about it is that, that wheat and tear look alike. And wheat and tear will grow in the same ground. But wheat and tear are not good friends. Tear will choke out wheat. Tear will choke out wheat. Huh? It will. It will destroy wheat. It will destroy wheat. You have to keep the weeds out of your garden. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, it says the Lord took Adam and placed Adam in the garden and told Adam to keep the garden. To keep the garden. To dress it and keep it. The word keep in Hebrew, as well as the, as well as the word keep in Old English, refers to a protective barrier. It refers to a protective fence. It refers to a keep, a, 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 a tower, a strong thing, a keep. Uh, it's, it's a place where you put things at that you don't want to be destroyed. When you put a keep in place, a keep will keep out those things that will choke out your seeds. But what can choke out your seeds? Walking out of love, being so super critical of everybody. That can choke out your seed. Walking in unforgiveness, walking in bitterness, walking in doubt, walking in strife. Those things can choke out your good seed that you planted. So the Bible tells us to guard your heart with all diligence because out of it comes the issues of life. And guard your heart with all diligence. Keep the weeds out of your heart. Pull the weeds out, not by its leaves. I've said this many times before. You don't pull it out by its leaves. You're just plucking and it'll grow back. You have to reach way down like Jesus reached way down. Jesus reached way down and, and pull you by and inner and pull you up. No, he reached way down underneath your feet, which was stuck on the mara clay, and he pulled you up. And number five, water the seed of your harvest. The Bible tells us in Psalm 67, 5 and 6, let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. And God, even our God, shall bless us. A farmer would never think of planting a field full of seeds and then neglect the water. He won't do that. It would be a, 
uh, a death sentence for his crop. He would do that. The same is true when we sow seed. Our seed needs to be watered. Our seed needs to be watered. We water seeds so much by our faith. What comes out of our mouth waters our seeds. Praise and thanksgiving is the language of faith. And those things water our seeds. Throughout the Bible, we see praise and thanksgiving associated with resulting harvest. We, we see this when, when they have certain feasts and stuff where they celebrate the harvest that God has given them. Uh, but before the harvest even comes, they have feasts that leads up to the harvesting. Hallelujah. Praise God and thank Him in advance for our harvests. Thank Him a hundredfold that everything is working all the time. Thank him for, for giving us the things that we have in order to reap great harvests. And here's the thing that, number six, here's the thing that we also need to consider. We have to put the sickle in to get the harvest. A sickle is one of those long things that has, has death holding it or something like that. Some, it's a long curved knife-like thing. It has a stick on the end. The Bible says in Mark 4 29, but when the grain is ripe and permits, immediately send forth the reapers and put in the sickle because the harvest is ready. Because the harvest is ready. Mark 4 29 demonstrates our role in reaping the harvest. To gather and collect our bountiful harvest, we must put in the sickle. That sharp instrument that's used for cutting crops during the harvest. Our sickle is the word of God. The word of God coming forth from out of our mouth. Hebrews 4 and 7 said, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts coming and going. The word of God is our strength, our hope. The word of God is that sickle that we use, that we speak forth to allow our harvest to come forth. We reap our harvest the same way we acquire anything else. By faith. By faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. Our words of faith cut down the crops and bring in the harvest. In fact, our words are important, an important part of the whole process of sowing and reaping. Because if you didn't have faith, you're not going to sow seed. If you ain't got faith, you're not going to tend to the seed that you've sown in the ground. If you ain't got faith, then you don't even go inspect the harvest because you haven't tended to the seed that was in the ground. Our faith is the most powerful harvesting tool that we have. Our faith. Our faith. And the last thing is number seven. Command your harvest to come. Command your harvest to come. Wow. And James 5 and 4 says, Behold the hire or the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you, kept back by fraud, cried, and the cries of them which have reaped the harvest are entered into the ears of the Lord. Say lie. When your harvest is ready, your harvest cries out for the rightful owner to come harvest the field. It cries out for the rightful owner, not for those who were just your servants while working with you, not for the enemy. Uh, it cries out for you, the rightful owner, to come forth and reap your harvest. It cries out for you to be a good steward over your harvest to ensure that no one steals your harvest from you. When your harvest is ready, it wants you to have it. You have to cry out to the Lord for your harvest. Now, the crowd does not mean to be whiny and pitiful because I know we can get our pity parties going in a heartbeat. It is a cry of faith. The crowd that means to proclaim. The crowd that means to demand immediate action with aggressiveness and force and passion. It means to cry out to Satan and say, Satan, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I rebuke you. It is to cry out to the Lord and say, I send my angel forth to reap my harvest. We got to practice these steps. In our hearts. We got to practice these steps. If we've been sowing seeds. And been sowing seeds for many years. 
It's time to call forth our harvest and see the great reward. We have to release our faith and reap the harvest. Because if we do not release our faith, which requires us to put forth the seed in the ground, which requires us to tend the seed in the ground, if we do not release our faith, then we're not going to ever reap the harvest. We're going to never reap our harvest. So seed, over time, becomes harvest. Seed over time becomes harvest. That's in, the, that's in a good way and also in a bad way. Seed over time, bad seed produces bad harvest. Good seed produces good harvest. But either way it go, you're going to reap your harvest because God is not to be mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, he is going to reap. And don't even think that the harvest principle does not apply to you. It applies to everyone. The harvest principle applies to everyone. If you sow, you're going to reap. Stand on your feet so we can pray. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your hope, your love, your tender mercy toward us, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that you're blessing us beyond our wildest imagination even now. And as we plant seed into good ground, that seed comes up with an abundance. I bind the enemy right now. I rebuke the destroyer of the harvest right now. The devourer of the harvest. I rebuke you right now in the name of Jesus. Your people, Lord God, has planted good seeds. Because they're planting good seeds, Lord God, they come with expectancy after working in the field, Lord God. They come with expectancy that that seed will come up great. They come with expectancy, Lord God, that that seed will be a blessing to them and their children. They come with expectancy, Lord God, it's already done in the name of Jesus. Now we give you worship, Hashem. We give you praise, we give you glory and honor right now. For your word, Lord God, is true. And your word, Lord God, manifests in our lives as never before. Your word, oh God, we thank you. As we pray for everyone, Lord God, underneath the venue of this watch. For everyone, Lord God, who have not made it out, Lord God, we pray for them as well. We pray for, Lord God, for those, Lord God, who are pressing forward. Lord God, we pray for the strength. We pray for the hope. We pray for the peace that surpasses all understanding. Now, I thank you for this word today. Let this word, Lord God, not fall on fallow ground. Let this word not fall on shallow soil. Let this word take an entrenchment in the lives of your people. Lord God, let this word be watered in their lives. That they, Lord God, may do all you call for them to do. It's in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, we do pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. It's all for time. I pray that you enjoyed the word today and that it touches you within a deep place in your heart and it will spark a change that should come about in your life. If the Lord so touched your heart and you have a desire to give, you can give to this ministry as we continue to make impacts in this city at our Givelify app. Simply download the Givelify app at one of the app or the Google store and look for Interceding Christian Center. Here at Interceding, we aspire to bring people to spiritual knowledge and thus victory. God bless you.